I'd like to thank Packin for the opportunity to present this work. It's been going on for a few years now at the Getty. Um, and as you might mention, as you might see, Kevin Marshall is also a co-author uh, co on this presentation. He was integral to getting this work done, so he definitely deserves to be up here. So Rita and I are going to alternate speaking, but before we get started, I have a few things to share. First is I'm a stutterer, so please bear with me if my fluency waxes and wanes. And then the second thing is that before coming here, I shared this presentation with Winifred, who's my eight-year-old daughter. And she's currently learning how to use PowerPoint. Um, and her strong critique was that my talk could greatly benefit from more fun slide transitions. <laughs> I took her advice to heart only two times. So without further ado. <laughs> I'll be very happy. So why should we monitor the transportation environment? It's during these periods that created objects may be subject to extremes in temperature, humidity, shock, and vibration. And this is illustrated by the image at the right, which depicts the transit of artwork by the monument men during World War II, so basically your predecessors. Created objects are being carried and slid down flights of stairs during the cold of winter. As a result, exposure to these environmental extremes can increase the risk of mechanical damage to an art object. Finally, the in situ performance of packing crates during transit is not commonly assessed. The genesis of the Transportation Environment Assessment Project came out of our aligned interests at the Getty Conservation Institute and in the Preparations Department of the J. Paul Getty Museum. At the GCI, the Managing Collection Environments Initiative examines the approach museums take towards their collection environments. Spurred by the debate about widening environmental guidelines in, in museums and its potential effect on objects, this initiative encompasses a number of projects, including the mechanical characterization of historic materials as a function of temperature and humidity, a comparison of documentation techniques to look at object change, and a current course on sustainable collection preservation. However, while the focus of this initiative was on the gallery and storage environment, it was always recognized that the guidance should also extend to the transportation environment. In turn, the preparations department at the J. Paul Getty Museum is quite prospective for the quality of their packing crates. And they were also interested in examining their in situ performance to ensure they were performing as expected. This provided us with a great opportunity to work together on developing a protocol to assess the environmental performance of J. Paul Getty Museum packing crates. At this point, I'd like to take a quick moment to pay homage to the Seminole Art and Transit Conference held in London town over 25 years ago. Organized by the CCI, the Smithsonian, the NGA, and the Tate, this conference and the two publications that came out of it have laid the foundation for much of this work. So our goal was to revisit their ideas using modern instrumentation and in the context of current packing techniques. Our protocol examined temperature, humidity, shock, and vibration. Temperature and humidity was recorded with the Rotronic data loggers, and shock and vibration were recorded with the Lanzmont Saver 3X90, this unit here, and 9X30 units. Um, these two saver units both contain internal triaxial accelerometers, while the 9X30 here allows for attachment to external accelerometers, in increasing our coverage. The shock and vibration events are recorded if an acceleration threshold is exceeded. In our case, our threshold was about a half G. Um, or it can trigger on a preset time interval. The idea was to examine these parameters in different places on a packing crate, including the exterior, and the exterior could be the ambient air, the truck floor, or the exterior crate. It could be the inner crate, it could be the climate box if present, and as close to the object as possible, for example, on the frame of a painting. But we'll present a number of case studies involving the transit of various objects. And I'll apologize now because I'm going to show a lot of plots. However, I'm going to try to be as clear as possible in describing them. I should also state that to this point, 
None of our monitoring has coincided with the reported damage on an object. So while temperature and humidity data are straightforward, I wanted to briefly describe the shock and vibration parameters that, that we examined. So here we see a schematic of a sh shock event over time. And the relevant value for a shock event is typically peak acceleration. So it's the high point of that event. And peak acceleration is expressed in terms of Gs. So if an object is exposed to a 2G event, it's going to feel a force that's twice its weight. So it's exposed to a 10G event, it'll be 10 times its weight. Another important piece of information is the area under the shock curve, and this is called velocity change. This area represents the energy in the event. So as you can imagine, like you can have a 10G event that has a very skinny peak, or you have a 10G event that has a very broad peak, and the energies are completely different in those two events. Now, in terms of vibration, we've been looking at vibration profiles that are characteristic of specific segments of the transit. On this plot, the vertical axis shows power spectral density. And you can just basically think of it as the energy or power of the vibration. And on the x-axis, I'm showing frequencies. So these plots allow us to identify what frequencies are most energetic. And this actually happens to be a profile recorded at the floor of a truck. And you can attribute different frequency ranges to various components. So the, the lower hertz ranges correlate to the suspension and the tires of the truck. And the higher frequencies are from the chassis and the truck structure itself. I'll turn it over to you, Rita. <laughs> Lot of practice. Um, this crate here is, uh, was designed to transport a uh, uh, ancient bronze vessel called the Lebus, and this piece uh, was transported um, to the Met from Los Angeles. And we used an anti-vibration system here, called, material called, product called Sorbothane, and then uh, the, we monitored this particular crate uh, obviously, we cannot put a device or a sensor on the object itself, so we put one underneath the deck that held the object. The wires go through here, and we put another one on the interior crate, and then one on the exterior crate. And uh, uh, these two runners here, once the object is packed completely in the, close, in the crate closed, we pull them out, and so now the crate is uh, free to float and to bound, I mean, to move uh, in, a, in, the, in these pads absorb whatever impact, rigor, shock, or vibration. So in other words, to isolate it. Um, we have a program that we work with. So in other words, when we do the math and calculations, we target certainly to isolate above 80%. So in this case, our calculations were turning out to be 97% isolation using the system. Um, uh, Sober thing is not only used between the inner and the outer crate, but it's also used right here. Uh, this is, a, I call it a, a skid sorbo hybrid suspension system <laughs> <laughs> because there's the donut for the, from the skid. And then, of course, this is something we put together, and you will see down the line another picture of it. Um, and then here we are, getting to the elevator, and then off it goes. Um, um, and in case we, as, we, we design according to what kind of rigor we're gonna, um, is the object going to travel, but uh, uh, we just, uh, you know, anything can happen just a mile away. And we finding out through this uh, uh, monitoring uh, situation that Vincent um, is interpreting all these graphs that often is the first mile and the last mile where uh, uh, a lot of shock and vibration that it can be harmful 
occurs. So. Uh -huh. Oh. So there's a oh, okay. All right. Well, um, I'll just read the text. Uh, this is a reference data chart that I actually saved from 1987 from Dow Chemical back in the day. And uh, you can see um, these uh, parameters that you can calculate your cushioning for and the typical drop heights. Uh, and uh, right here, this is the one. That's the one we keep an eye on. Anyway, uh, estimate object fragility, 15 to 25 Gs for extreme fra fragile objects. Here we are. We set our parameters to this level, but of course there's some objects, for example, the Lebes for extreme fragility in this case. Um, we select the, the material that would work best for the project, and, um, uh, but once you set up to do the calculations, you need the overall weight because there's cushioning of the object itself, and then there's cushioning of the interior crate with contents, and then sometimes you think about the overall exterior, which is where the feet come in, you know, the hybrid. Um, and then, of course, again, these are the range of drop heights. This one, the 30, is pretty much your FedEx uh, uh, transportation overnight, no courier, but pretty much here it is. Our most, most crates uh, loaded are about 250, so anything over 250 and really over 225 is you calculate for a... Um, 12 inch drop height. Um, this one next again. Yeah. Um, again, 1987. And uh, obviously, an all example of ethyl and polyethylene by, now owned by Sealed Air. Um, this is typically what the cushion curve charts look like, and then when you, for example, here on this Ethafilm 220, which we call polyethylene 220, um, you get the first impact, and here's the curve of, for example, two inch thick foam, and it says a one PSI for a single drop, and here is again two inch thick, and there is the line, oh, my hand is a little shaky. Uh, right here, 30, 40, and then up and down, 0.5, but there's the one, up. Oh. Um, in any case, so that's how we determine the PSI. So here is PSI, do the, your division by your total weight, and then um, the thickness of the foam, and then the, the G that you're targeting, for example, zero to 20, so that's extreme fragility, and then of course, very fragile. There next. Um, so I took the best, the best possible performance for the product and made a little chart. And here's my, my chart. Uh, and then based on the experience and observation data available from the past catalogs and polyethylene calculations have been developed uh, in-house that are better suited specifically for, um, our, uh, for, for the objects. Um, and here's your, your typical, pretty much, that we use. The densities of all of the variety of foam. I just took the best performance. Uh, we just recently used this, which is ex very, very rare. You have to have a very heavy object, very um, load-bearing area in order to apply that. Uh, I do find it very interesting that if you're gonna calculate you know, for example, 5,000 pounds, and you're gonna suggest 18 inch drop, you actually divide by five, but you increase the thickness of the foams. So the foams increase, and here the, the PSI is the same, but the thickness is bigger. So it's very interesting to um, see that. Um, is this yours or me? 
Oh, okay. Uh, we presented just in uh, last fall in Maastricht, um, Netherlands, um, our uh, results regarding the transportation of uh, objects, in this case, panel paintings, uh, in not in frame microclimate box uh, panel paintings. In other words, if the painting is not in a microclimate in the frame or traveling inside uh, display, just the panel painting, we make uh, microclimate for transport uh, boxes. In this case, uh, this panel painting went to the NGO and uh, this were three, three paintings. And this is, you saw Ursula, that was one. This is another one, a triptych. And over here, it's, that's where Ursula, the panel you just saw, and then here's the taller triptych panel painting, and then here's this one. All these three panel paintings did not, were not in climate boxes uh, for display, but only for transport, so that this is what that is. Made with uh, ultra board, uh, aluminum face, the aluminum is inside, and this is um, um, high impact uh, polystyrene um, uh, skin. And it's a material made use for signage actually, but it has, uh, it's a foam <coughs> cord, so there's uh, expanded foam in the, in the center, and it comes either a half inch all the way to three inches thick, um, white or black. Um, and again, and then these three paintings, um, for example, Ursula had a data logger, and that's inside here. Uh, we put a data logger for uh, temperature and humidity in this case, and it's inside right here, the inner crate. And we did not put one between the inner crate and the outer. Again, this is uh, suspended with servo thing. These are pull out. Um, isolators, so then, because sometimes the pressure can push the lid in a little bit, so we want to put the lid in first, then put the pads in. And then we put a isolator on, up, 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 a data logger outside of this crate. Uh, the overall crate system, it's really more like a shed. Um, it's right here. Um, And this is our crate closed, and there's another data logger for our temperature and humidity here, the banding, because it's tall cargo. And for us, it is extremely, extremely important, and Vincent will tell you why, uh, that we, in the packing area and in our instructions, and it's part of the loan agreement, to please wrap the crate in plastic in the, uh, packing site, in other words, whether it's in the gallery or a packing room with the appropriate uh, uh, environment um, requested, so. Oh! I have the graph. Okay, so this plot shows temperature and humidity. Temperature's in red. Humidity is in blue uh, during the transit of this painting from the J. Paul Getty Museum to the AGO. Um, the dotted lines um, are the exterior, uh, dash lines in her crate, and the solid lines are inside the climate box. And thanks to our courier, I know the events that happened during the transit, and I'll take you through them now. So this is time at the J. Paul Getty Museum, and then this is at LAX after a brief truck ride. Here's our flight, and here's the truck ride from the airport to the AGO, and you can see there's a big drop in exterior relative humidity during that period, and then time at the AGO. So if you focus on RH in blue, you can see there are differences between the exterior and inner areas, but it's easier to compare using a box plot. So this is the same RH data, just compressed for each location, exterior on the left, inner crate in the middle, climate box on the right. The y-axis is, is humidity. And the boxes encompass the 50% in the middle of the data set. 
and it's easiest to compare these boxes at each of the different areas. And you can see the exterior box has the highest height, indicating a wide humidity range. In contrast, the boxes for the inner crate and the climate box are quite narrow, indicating it didn't change too much during the transit. Now let's expand the plot to focus in on the temperature data. Here we see similar temperature ranges for all three areas. I'm going to hammer it in with the box plot. Um, and while the temperature ranges are similar, you do see differences. The, the areas inside the crate exhibit a delayed response relative to the exterior. And this is particularly important after the packing crate has arrived at the receiving institution. In this case, it's at the AGO. So, so if the crate had been open soon after arriving, there would have been a temperature difference of 10 degrees Fahrenheit between the object and the exterior, putting the object at risk for condensation on the surface. If you wait 24 hours, that difference drops at 5 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you wait 48 hours, that difference drops to 1 degree Fahrenheit. This illustrates the importance of waiting to open the crate, allowing the case interior a chance to equ equilibrate to the exterior conditions. Now, I wanted to briefly address the effect of wrapping plastic around the exterior crate. In this case, I have a temperature humidity data logger positioned above the plastic and a second one between the plastic and the exterior crate. And here's the data. So again, blue and red are humidity and temperature. And in this case, the dotted line is the exterior. Um, and the dashed line is the, the data logger between the plastic and the exterior crate. So you can see that the temperature at the, those two locations is, is the same. The plastic has virtually no thermal mass to de delay the response. However, you can see that the humidity of the exterior has these big changes, but the humidity under that plastic is extremely narrow. So it's basically completely separating it from the exterior RH conditions. Okay, Rita. Uh, at Maastricht, uh, we presented this, uh, the transportation of these little panel painting is a diptych, it's hinged. I can't let go of my tape measure, excuse me. Uh, it was free. <laughs> Put it in my cargo pocket. All right, force of habit. Um, so this is a little diptych and we have, it's hinged in this area. It's extremely fragile so we cannot fold it in, so we made a little um, um, microclimate for transport box, uh, similar materials as mentioned before, and the uh, stigmatization of St. Francis in here, and the angel climbing St. Cecilia here, and this little painting is, uh, I think it's 12 inches tall and about 18 wide, and uh, and really, it's nice to look at in this big screen. And there's a little owl right there. <laughs> we like the birds too. Um, uh, here's the microclimate box. In this case, we use like the dotty paintings, one inch thick, uh, ultra aluminum face uh, panel, and uh, all bevel cuts. And here's the data logger for temperature and um, relative humidity. Um, putting these decks allow us to, um, well, of course, we're cushioning the object, but it allows us to put the device in. We notch the corners for in case in these areas to put uh, silica gel, for example. Bronze objects sometimes require that. Um, or if the conservator um, uh, wants to send some silica gel within this environment, we sometimes do that with silver objects, too. Um, and then, of course, here's the cover for this piece. Uh, and on this side, this is, of course, the exterior crate, then the interior crate, and then, of course, here's our microclimate box. Um, this bi um, microclimate box with its contents weighs 16 pounds. The, six, the calculation, as mentioned before, for example, in this case, using polyethylene 220 would be one. Therefore, 16 divided by one is 16 divided by four pads. 
one, two, three, four, um, uh, at two inches square or making sure each pad is two inches, so it's two times two is four, and four times four is 16. That's our calculation. Data logger at the bottom of the interior crate, all the mounts. Um, <clears throat> The interior crate was a, a extra tall, so we can accommodate the mount down below. By the way, this was a repurposed crate. This is probably its uh, mm, uh, fifth shipment, but its third artwork. Um, there's the box inserted. Again, we're using, in this case, specially ordered uh, <clears throat> by request uh, uh, sorbothane ring, and that means ID, uh, there is one inch, but its outside dimension would be uh, three inches tall, four inches diameter, special order 25 durometer. It's almost pretty much like a gel pad. And then we, we cut these in-house to mount it uh, inside, between the inner and the outer crate. Um, when, if you download this program from Servothane, they will not ha give you this option. Uh, but we have worked with them directly with the engineers. Um, okay. Uh, this is our kit, how we make this hybrid system. So I'll just read it. Feet our server thin skin made hybrid suspension system. And this crate, this is the bottom of the Santa Cecilia crate. And we have it right now slung on slings. So like a car, you know, when you raise it up to work on it, this is kind of makes it fun and easy. Um, six feet and four are of the green ones. So um, at 30, 50 uh, pound range. And then the center ones, the hard ones, harder ones are in the center. Um, I learned many years ago from going to a, um, workshop with the professional packers, I forget, my former boss, Bruce Metro, sent me. And in there, there were people all, from all over uh, industries, particularly military. And in an accident, uh, they were running out of polyethylene foam to test, make some tests to send some equipment somewhere. Uh, they found out that they put harder foam in the middle. And uh, even though you can use the appropriate skid mates or hybrid system here, by putting the harder ones in the middle, uh, it reduces vibration. So in this case, we're really throwing everything we can at this project. So from the ring right here, which is this guy, and that, the ring is a 30 durometer. You can buy that right off the shelf. Any of the ranges from 30, 50, 70, but I think 40 and 62. Uh, 70. Anyway, and we cut this in-house. And here we are trying to, uh, Vincent brings us the data loggers and the triaxialometers. Accelerometers. Accelerometers. And uh, we assign it to the uh, saver nine times 30. Is it? Yeah, okay. Um, and we play. Obviously, we can't place it on the object. We thought the deck was a little too uh, light, so we put it outside the climate box. We want to see what the climate do does. And then the interior crate. And then here's the exterior crate. Uh, crate 125, we have an inventory of over uh, 250 growing. Crate 125 is 45 inches long, 45 inches tall, 28 inches deep. So by the way, putting the, the skid and sorbo hybrid, um, it lends itself to also be quite stable because it has depth, despite its height. Um, and he, here are all the wires, come, well, you saw, you saw all the, the wires coming out through, um, just like the Levis. We start with the deck, interior crate, exterior crate, everybody meets at the top. Right here. And then we put a protective cover, also <coughs> made in-house by our uh, machinist, uh, Butch Green. And then here we are, going through the, um, uh, from our packing area, 
into the elevator or freight elevator, by the way, notice here, TSA, um, going in, uh, fastening into the truck, from the loading dock at the airport, and our, was this yours when? Yeah. Huh? Oh, there you go. <laughs> Self-explanatory. <laughs> it went to the Walters. <laughs> Is that me? I think that's it. Okay. So I should mention that um, I gave Rita and her team our, our data logs or NRX accelerometers, but I've never installed one because they're the experts in installing that equipment for me. So th this plot shows a time series of the shock events recorded at the climate box, the exterior crate, and the truck floor during the transit of this panel painting from the Getty to the Walters. And the y-axis shows acceleration, again, in units of G. So I want to take you through this trip. So this is time at the J. Paul Getty Museum. This is the truck ride to LAX. This is our time at LAX, and you can see that the highest G events are recorded at the airport. And then at the airport room, um, this is the flight. And you can see that the sh shock events are only timer events. Our half-G threshold hadn't been exceeded uh, during flight. And this is quite consistent in all the flights that we've monitored. And then time at the airport, the truck ride from the airport to, to the Walters. And this period shows relatively low G events. Everything is under about two Gs. And then time at the Walters. Now, if you recall, at the start of the talk, I mentioned another variable of interest with respect to shock, and that was velocity change. So I'm going to step aside from this case study just for a bit to discuss how we can use acceleration and velocity change in tandem. So the plot that we just looked at was acceleration on the y and time on the x-axis. So let's change velocity change on the x-axis. In the commercial packing industry, there's often discussion of a product's critical acceleration and critical velocity change. And these indicate the thresholds beyond which a product is going to incur damage and define what is known as the damage boundary curve. These thresholds are determined by subjecting the weakest part of a product to a series of tests until damage is observed. Obviously, I'm not advocating that we break artwork to define its damage boundary curve, <laughs> but I present this to illustrate that not all high G events are the same. For example, if, if the one has a high G event that has a high velocity change, there's a possibility it's gonna be damaging. However, if you have a high, a high G event with a low velocity change, it probably isn't going to be impactful on the object. So if I return to the acceleration versus time slide that we saw previously, let's now replace on the x-axis velocity change. And here we see a spread of data, and I want to draw your attention to three events, this one and these two here. Okay. So this specific event was the highest G event that was seen at LAX. It has a relatively low velocity change and did not coincide with the shock event inside the crate. And if I take you back to that other plot, here's that event there, and you don't see anything else happening at the same time. Now, if we go back to this plot, I'd like to highlight these two events. They have relatively high Gs, but they're not quite as high as the event previously shown. Here we see two coincident events. There's an event on the exterior crate, but at the same time I see one on the climate box. So while this event had a lower G than the previous one, it contained more energy and presumably was able to transmit a significant portion to the interior of the climate box. And again, if I go back to this slide, you can see those two points grouped together. So at this point in the transit at LAX, our courier was not able to observe the activity around the crate. So what might cause such an event? A possibility is this. So Professor Nobuyuki Kamba and his colleagues from the Tokyo National Museum have 
reported such high G events when objects are being moved on non-air ride dollies during the transfer of cargo to and from the airplane. It hasn't happened 100% of the time during our monitoring, but we have noticed these high G events at the airport during a number of transits. And now I'd like to focus on the truck segment from the J. Paul Getty Museum to LAX. And as you may have noticed, this is the only section that has data from the truck floor. And what I show you now is the vibration profile in the vertical direction at the truck floor. It has a peak at two hertz and then it declines. This represents a possible input to the crate. Now if we add the profile at the exterior crate, we see a similar peak at two hertz, and then we also see a peak at 15 and 100 hertz. But you also see a mitigation in the vibration between 20 and 70 hertz and above 150 hertz. If we add the profile for the climate box, you see that above 20 hertz, the vibration energy is below that of the truck floor. Okay, really. Uh, here's another case of a bronze that the Getty borrowed from a uh, Vienna museum. And uh, in situ, the conservator, Eric Razor, uh, we shipped this, this, ca this cage. And while the object is still on display, the cage was uh, placed on Apoxomenos, a Hellenistic bronze statue. And um, the... Eric Ferrar is here, uh, and uh, Eric uh, scanned the form of the Paxmenos to have these uh, polystyrene, polystyrene BJ yeah. blocks made, and then they sent all the all the equipment, all the materials to Vienna. Inside the cage went inside its exterior single crate. Again, using the sorbothane. In this case, it's not a ring. It's actually a disc. And now we're actually coding the, the mounting so we know which durometer. So it is a disc, uh, 70 duro with a um, average weight capacity of each one of these, 140 pounds. So he, he's, uh, he was almost 1,000 once he was created. Um, 900 pounds or so. We thought it was going to be less, but anyhow, this actually, for the calculation, it turned out to be better. And, um, and uh, we have a Saver 390 placed on the cage, and I guess uh, Vincent will give you more. And again, once again, the hybrid feet. Okay, so now let's take, take a look at the shock events recorded during the transit of epoxy menos from Vienna to Florence. First we have handling in Vienna, and you notice a large number of high G events. Storage, truck transit, again, small G events happening during this period, storage, and then handling in Florence. Again, you see a high number of high G events. I'd like to point out two distinct periods during the handling at either end uh, that correspond to when the inner cage was being moved to the exterior crate. So this is independent of the exterior crate. These are the areas in green, and these are the areas that have the high G events. And the other one is the area in pink, which is when the inner and the exterior crate are being moved in tandem. Now, as we did previously, let's now plot the velocity change on the x-axis and recall the concept of the damage boundary curve. Not all high G events are the same. Here's this plot showing the events at the inner cage and the exterior crate, but I want to reassign the points to handling in green and truck transit in orange. And what's clear is that all the high G events corresponding to handling in Vienna and Florence are associated with very low velocity change or energy. And if we think back to the idea of the damage boundary curve, are unlikely to cause damage to an object. So you guys are doing a great job. Thank you. 
Um, here it is, Apoximenos fully created inside the crate. Uh, it went from Vienna to Florence, and then Florence to Los Angeles. Los Angeles had a show, and now we're going to Washington, D.C. And um, um, in this case, we are using, it's a course, traveling crate, and around the corner we put the um, uh, triaxial accelerometer attached to this crate, and then one on our uh, Victorious Youth bronze uh, sculpture, and then those two connect to our Sabre uh, 930 here. So we're monitoring the floor in both crates. Uh, inside the cage, again, we're using the 390, um, just like uh, the transfer from Vienna to Florence. Um, and in each of those cases, uh, Vincent downloaded the data so we can start fresh for each uh, movement. Um, there are more crates, more objects, anyway. I'm sorry? Oh. Oh, and here's our victorious youth, and him, and there he is, uh, object from the Veil Collection. And um, I was noticing when Vincent and I were preparing for this talk that um, a standard exterior crate would repurpose exterior crate as interior crate. And see here? Um, but what I was also counting were the amounts of suspension systems this crate in itself, the overall packing here has, like the feet with the sorbo, one, two, uh, sorbo here, three, four, five, six, before you get to the object. And then if you add, you know, uh, tires, air ride bags, floor of the truck, and yet here we only have this between that and of course what he's surrounded with. Um, uh, again, this is a repurposed in, uh, exterior crate used for that, but we <coughs> needed this room to uh, uh, put silica gel for him to travel with in Mount Meek. Okay, so I just want to quickly look at the shock events on this transit um, of epoxy minerals and Victoria youth from the Getty to the NGA. As you can see all the high G events are happening at the truck floor. A maximum of 18 Gs was recorded, I believe, when the truck backed into the dock at the NGA. However, most of the events at the inner crate of Victorious Youth and the inner cage of Epoxy Menos are under 2 Gs. The thing I'd like to focus on is vibration. So here we see the vibration profile in the vertical direction for the truck floor in blue inner crate of Victorious Youth in orange, and the inner cage of Epoxy Menos in green. And we see that the inner packaging systems perform similarly, mitigating vibration above 25 hertz. If we look at the vibration profiles in the side-to-side -side direction, you see dampening above 65 hertz, but you also see amplification in the Epoxy Menos cage at 2 hertz. And this amplification is again seen at 2 hertz in the longitudinal direction. Um, and while this plot is specific to the Getty DC transit, this trend was also ob observed in Epoxy Menos' journey from Vienna to Florence, Florence to the Getty, and DC back to Vienna. So, so, so because Victorious Youth had not exhibited such amplification at, at, at low frequencies, one possible cause we thought of at the time was that it was due to the metal cage of Epoxy Menos. That was a major difference in the packing of the two objects. Another possible reason could be the elevated height of the shock and vibration data logger in Epoxy Menos. It was up near the upper torso compared to Victoria's Youth that sat horizontal and was close to the truck floor. However, keep this in mind as we go to the next case study. Uh, this is a painting, Valentin de Bologna, uh, Christ in the Adulteress. 1620, and it's a fairly large painting. Oh, wrong button. Um, okay, here we go. Uh, this painting weighs 146 pounds, and uh, it has a very, quite hefty frame, but uh, uh, sturdy, sturdy. Here we are placing it in a, again, repurposing crate. Uh, 
when we were going to, when we, uh, this crate uh, was assigned for shipment, uh, maybe yeah, seven years ago, uh, I asked the registrars to give me the list of the largest paintings in the collection because I didn't see fit that one painting, a square, very tall, uh, this crate would only be used one time. So I chose seven biggest paintings to make a crate to accommodate those seven in the future. Since then, this crate exterior has traveled three times, three different loans, three different uh, exhibitions, th three different paintings. And so therefore, we just make sure that the interior crate works very well with the painting that it's carrying. And here's the interior. But you can see there's a big gap of space up there. But that's not a problem. Again, we're calculating here for a uh, 146. Mm, I think in this case, we're using foam 400. So that's a, a 1.25. Five, uh, in other words, but it requires still a lot of uh, contact. So in order to suffice, for example, on the vertical, see solid foam all the way, uh, we have these pull-out inserts um, where it's right here where your hand would go. So we're placing it in, take the insert out, place the painting in, replace the insert. The other thing we found out here, here, is that we requested the little tape be placed on the uh, nuts that regulate the height leveling mechanism on the hanging block uh, because vibration is not a very nice thing and sometimes they do fall off if they are left loose. So in this case, it's part of our uh, instructions to the courier, please tape those. Even though you may tighten them very well uh, uh, just recently, just recently, we found two on the floor, but since we've always packed face in, and so we make sure if they do drop, they're away from the uh, pad area here. Uh, this crate is uh, 118 inches long, um, 24 deep, that's two feet, and 112 uh, height. It weighs uh, 1,200 pounds, fully packed. Okay. Keep going? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So here is uh, the crate for the Bologna inside the truck. And here's the monitor. Uh, that's a 390. But in here, at the same height, doop, wall of the truck, 84 inches. Inside the frame of the Bologna also is a triaxial measuring uh, device, the um, accelerometer. Um, at the same height. Now, this crate in the truck is isolated from the truck wall using several thing uh, pads, one inch thick. And we made this uh, angle uh, MDO um, structure here in order to then over that strap the crate in. This is actually um, uh, painted by Winterhalter that went to a uh, museum in Houston. And again, we're measuring the same, so same thing here. And of course, data f uh, collecting here for uh, humidity and temperature. There's the same thing. In this case, um, all this architecture foam padding here is because this particular handle designed for this very ornate frame swings out. There's the handle, the wood part, swings out all the way out to here. So we're need to pull out these inserts, which call, we call also tension panels, and then put the actual padding in. Both of these are calculated for a 12-inch drop height. Both of them will weigh, uh, well, 1,200 pounds, about 1,200 pounds. This crate, however, is uh, 130 inches long, uh, 98 tall, and 28 inches deep by the time it's all said and done. Vincent's turn. Okay, so the thing I want to focus on here is the vibration profile and the um, vertical direction of the three locations. Truck floor um, in blue, frame of the painting in orange, and truck wall in red. Here you can see the profiles are fairly similar in the particle direction. 
you look at the lateral direction, you see higher energies for the frame and truck wall at two hertz compared to that of the truck wall. Have we seen this before? Poxyamenos. And the same pattern is again observed in the longitudinal direction of the Bologna crate with higher energy at two hertz, part of the frame and truck wall, which match what was observed for epoxymenos. Clearly, it's interesting that the frame of the Polonia painting seems to be impacted by the, th the vibration coming from the truck wall. And if you think back to epoxymenos, the thing it has in common with the Polonia crate is packing crate orientation. Both the Polonia and epoxymenos crates are tall, and they're in contact with nearly the full height of that truck wall. In contrast, the crate for Victorious Youth has a much lower profile and is only in contact with the, the lower portion of the truck wall. So, so we've continued to look at this truck wall interaction in other transits, and it's of interest to see if you can mitigate this amplification at two hertz with, with modified packing techniques. So just going to the conclusions, in terms of humidity, RH is typically stable inside the crate, um, and if you use plastic wrapping, it does effectively separate the crate from exterior RH conditions. Temperature, the interior temperature is influenced by the exterior, but it exhibits a delay. Important to wait 24 hours before opening the case to allow time for equilibration. For shock, you can monitor shock throughout the case to see how it's, how it's mitigated. And the highest acceleration events are recorded during handling with a caveat. The caveat being at the airport, these handling events are typically associated with high velocity change. During handling at the museum, they're typically associated with the low velocity change. And at the airport and the truck, the uh, Gs are quite small. And vibration profiles uh, give us the ability to see how a packing system dampens or amplifies external vibration inputs. So possible future work. Um, it's important to continue our in-situ monitoring at the JPGM, particularly for objects that are extremely fragile, and if we decide to use modified packing techniques. It's also of interest to apply this protocol beyond the Getty to packing crates from other cultural heritage institutions, particularly uh, commercial crates. And it would also be interesting to try to define damage boundary curves for mock-up objects of varying fragilities. The question always is going to be is how representative is this mock-up to the actual artwork, but at least it gives us a starting point to sort of see where that curve is. And this is my other transition. <laughs> so finally, all projects are a team effort, and this one is no, um, is particularly true of this one. Uh, we'd like to thank our colleagues from the GCI, uh, Getty Preps, Conservation, Curatorial, and Registrars, and I think we probably missed a few still. If you need more information, our email addresses are at the bottom. Uh, thank you for your time. <laughs>